Welcome back to Armex and the Rapid Energy Sports Enhancement Technique or RESET. First a disclaimer. There are potential hazards that you'll face when practicing any new breathing technique that only your physician can specifically clear you of. So if you practice this technique incorrectly or over top of a precondition known or unknown to you, there are potential dangers that you'll face. So this is no joke, please clear this technique specifically with your physician before beginning. I began my research into my breathing techniques and biofeedback about 10 years ago. And in 2004, a student and former colleague, Dr. Robert Stein, presented his findings on the technique to the American Bio Biofeedback Association. Now, although I've began my research about 10 years ago, it's only recently that I began actual trials with one of the universities I'm working with. So at this point, the technique you're about to learn still remains purely anecdotal despite the incredible success rate that my clients experience. My background, where I learned the technique and started implementing it was in the tactical and combatives communities when I found that stress physiology and combat psychology started to meld together. And although the technique has been used successfully in other amateur and professional sports, my main concentration still remains mixed martial arts and submission fighting, so it will be within that description that I present the technique. Reset is a simple technique, but involves several key components and layers. So if you were to present these techniques to, to your training or to your athletes, in a combination different than I'm presenting or with the components independent of one another, I can't guarantee the same results that I've had. However, I can guarantee that if you present this technique into your training or with your athletes in the specific organization that you're about to learn, I have had 100% success rate with my clients. Now, although you'll experience immediate results, I've found that in order to make those results concrete, latch in, and rewire the nervous system, it takes about two to four months of consistent practice. And once you do, reset will increase your economy. You'll use less total energy in your training and in your performance. It'll increase your efficiency, so you'll get to use more uh, effective work out of the total effort that you expend. And you'll increase your total energy, meaning that you will have an extra reserve by releasing yourself of the total expen unnecessary expenditures that you're making. So what I'll do is I'll present to you the theory behind it and how I stumbled upon the organization of the components. And then we'll get on to the technique itself. The theory behind reset is in three aspects. There's the breathing, the vibration, and then the biofeedback. The first aspect to reset theory is our breath. In Russia, and working with the national and Olympic coaches, I was exposed to a wide curriculum of breathing techniques, which specifically regarded performance enhancement, but some of it was in lieu of health. So my main concern with my clients is first, career longevity, and second, performance enhancement. Um, I selected those techniques that would first ensure that they would be able to continue in their sport or their activity beyond just the next event. As a result, the, the fraction of techniques that you're about to learn, although a very small compartment of actual techniques, they're the ones that organize uh, on your ability to continue in your sport for as long as possible, as well as simultaneously working to enhance performance. Now how this works with breath is, Breath is plugged into both branches of our nervous system, both the autonomic and the voluntary. The autonomic nervous system is basically our life support system. So you can consciously or voluntarily decide to hold your breath, but you may not hold your breath until you die. Your central, central nervous system will just come in and hijack your basic life support system and cause you to breathe again. Now, there are other aspects to this that we're going to discuss and how that impacts this technique. Your voluntary uh, nervous system allows you to breathe consciously. So I can decide to, at any moment in time, inhale, 
take a large breath. I can also, if I'm suffering from some type of pre-competitive or even competitive anxiety, uh, if I find that I've been holding my breath, I can decide to exhale and relax. Now, manipulating that, we're trying to basically, if our nervous system is a team of sled dogs, uh, we want to put breath in front of them because we can't consciously control our heart rate. Although our heart rate, it has such an impact on our athletic performance. We can't con consciously control our blood pressure either, even though that has such a huge impact on our health. But we can consciously control our breath. So if we put breath in front of that team of sled dogs, if we make breath the alpha dog, we can consciously influence the rest of our life support systems. How that basically works is, if I inhale and hold my breath, what happens is my heart rate jumps up, my uh, beats per minute increases, and my blood pressure skyrockets. Now, that's a useful mechanism in cases of imminent jeopardy. So if I needed to move a seemingly immovable object, or I needed to stop uh, an apparently unstoppable object uh, in cases of a crisis. I have that mechanism there. So I can just brace and hold. Uh, that's a useful mechanism uh, if you don't have any skills. If you don't have any survival skills, you have some type of biological defense mechanism to survive a crisis. So you have this temporary bracing strength but it's just a trick, it's not true strength. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if I decide to exhale, and not inhale, that control pause, as it's called in respiratory science, the period after my exhale is completed, but before my inhalation begins, my heart rate drops, and my blood pressure goes down. So, you know, the breathing is the, the alpha dog in this case. Being able to control my heart rate and blood pressure is in direct proportion to how much I inhale and, and pressurize or brace and how much I exhale and control pause. So if I inhale and brace hard, I can increase my heart rate faster and my blood pressure higher. If I exhale long and extend that control pause, then I actually can continue to slow down my heart rate and drop my blood pressure. That's the key to athletic performance. All skills happen, all fine motor skills, all refined skills, and we're talking about elite skills. I'm not talking about gross motor uh, survival aspect skills, which are tied in, they're bound to that inhalation and embracing. That's a, a survival reflex, and there's a whole casc cascade of hormones that are attached to that. What we're talking about for rapid energy sports enhancement technique, the reset button, is the exhalation and the drawing out of that control pause. The longer your control pause, the more your heart rate drops down. The slower your heart rate and the lower your blood pressure, the more you increase in precision and accuracy with your skills because the quieter your body becomes. The first time I worked with an Olympic athlete was uh, an Olympic archer. And she, uh, one of the skills that she had to learn was waiting for the pause between heart heartbeats. In between heartbeats would be when she let loose the arrow because that's when the body was most still. Now, when it comes to sports like mixed martial arts and submission fighting, that seems like an impossibly difficult task, but it's not worth pursuing. If you look at the, the masters in any type of style, whether it be judo or jiu-jitsu or sambo or muay they're completely relaxed, nonchalant, aplomb. They're unfazed by what's happening around them. And if you look at their breathing, it's not <sighs> rapid and uncontrolled and hypoventilatory. It's relaxed, it's that exhalation, it's that control pause. So with our technique, with this reset technique, what you're going to be learning is how to manipulate that exhalation and draw out the control pause. Putting the 
breath in front of that team of sled dogs so that your breathing leads the way. That's the first aspect and it's the most critical aspect of the reset technique. The second aspect to the theory behind the reset technique is vibration. First breathing, then vibration, finally biofeedback. Vibration technique was originally developed for the Russian space program, but because of the massive results that they observed with their cosmonauts, it quickly leached over into athletic peak performance for their sports program. Now, after returning from Russia, it took me around 10 years to fully understand, the, to the degree that we can, the science behind it to await the development of Western counterparts to the high technology and to develop a process for finding consistently repeatable results with my athletes. There's a low-tech and a high-tech version to this, obviously. The low-tech version is what we'll be concentrating on. The high-tech version uh, requires a, a large financial investment. But with the low-tech version, which you'll be learning, you can have access to immediate results. And you'll quickly find that it starts to jump over, cross over into actual performance, not just as an effective means to reset for recovery but it starts to impact all of your skills and you'll understand why in just a moment. Although there's a, a great degree of science behind this in Eastern Europe, Western researchers don't yet fully understand the exact mechanisms behind vibration technique for performance enhancement. Some potential ad adaptations include uh, central and peripheral nervous excitation. And what that basically means is by stimulating the nervous system, you improve restoration. You'll find that your rate of recovery in between high exertion, so how quickly you go into aerobic cadet and start, to, and start to gas, you'll find that you recover faster from that through this technique. There'll be increased hormonal and chemical release, which is a lot of the geek stuff we don't really need to go into at this point, uh, that really requires a coaching staff behind you, but know that there are certain chemical and hormonal processes that will be accelerated uh, beneficially behind this. There'll be excitation of your Golgi tendon organ, and what that basically means is it will inhibit antag antagonistic activation. So if you need to pull really hard with your bicep, you need to contract your bicep, you need to pull hard and fast and accurately, if your tricep is contracting at the same time, you have a co-contraction of the agonist and the antagonist that is slowing down, decreasing the performance and diminishing the power of your ability to contract. So by stimulating the Golgi tendon organ through this vibration technique, you basically have no break on the opposite side. So nothing is slowing you down from adding those driving forces. There are no restrictive forces, just driving forces. The other aspect of that is that there'll be excitation of uh, sensory receptors in your soft tissues, like your muscle spindles. So you'll actually be able to contract more. And basically what this means is, if you want to contract a muscle, and the more that you start from, from a maximally relaxed state, the more you can contract the muscle, the stronger the pull. So if it's already tense, if you do like a dynamic tension exercise and then try and punch while already tense, you basically have to relax the muscle and then extend. So if you look at masterful performance, those fighters are walking in as if it's just another day of training. Their bodies are completely relaxed. That allows them to generate maximal, maximal tension for just a fraction of a second. So by stimulating those sensory organs, your allowing your body to not only increase its power and speed and strength, but increase its reactivity. So the other, another potential adaptation is increasing the synchronization of the motor units. That's a complicated way of saying that your coordination and your agility will increase by the firing pattern of your skills syncing up more fluidly. Uh, each skill isn't one muscle. Like we, we never 
perform any sport with just activation of one muscle because in truth there's there's not there are not hundreds of muscles in your body there's just one large muscle sheath with hundreds of attachment points so increasing how that tension is slung across the body uh, increasing its the coordination of the firing improves your skill so the vibration technique is going to increase how that sinks up this is the low tech version like I said once you start practicing it it's going to have immediate results in your recovery you'll you'll find that you become relaxed more quickly and your heart rate drops much faster and I mean dramatically faster in a short amount of time however as you continue to consistently practice it it's going to it can't be compartmentalized basically you're gonna rewire your neuromuscular system you're gonna reprogram it so that when you actually go to perform you're relaxing as much as possible where you don't need it so if if initially when if when you watch a new a new athlete he comes in he's all generally tense he's so tense that he's so slow and inaccurate and lacking stamina that it takes time for him to be able to relax into his own skin relax into the sport this is a way to accelerate that and to make that last 20 percent jump because the difference between good fighters and great fighters isn't merely better coaching it's access to more accelerated techniques to gain that last 20 percent of performance that any coach can get you up to the lap that that first 80 percent if you have the will and the drive and the discipline but that last 20 percent is what's key that last 20 percent is where you're going to need techniques like this especially the vibration technique so that it transfers over into your general performance you become more relaxed and able to relax while performing that's the key with vibration technique the third aspect to the theory behind the reset button is your heart rate biofeedback and biofeedback has a lot of science behind it which we don't need to go into but because you can validate it for yourself if you were to find your pulse and you find your pulse and then you look at your clock and you count the beats for 15 seconds and you multiply that by four that's your your beats per minute that right there if you're not doing anything right now while you're watching it is probably close to what your base heart rate is now if you were to inhale and brace and squeeze you'll find that you're going to increase your heart rate so just test it but just for 10 or 15 seconds if 10 seconds multiply it appropriately inhale hold your breath and as you inhale you're going to find that your heart rate increases as you brace it continues to increase as you press pressurize your heart rate continues to increase the opposite of this is also true so you find your heart rate you start to exhale and you feel your heart rate slowing down and as you don't inhale you extend that pause that control after the exhalation before the inhalation that's when your heart rate is its most manipulable you'll be able to slow it the most like Debussy said about music being the space between notes high athletic performance is the space between your heartbeats so the longer that you can stretch out those beats per minute the longer that you can stretch out that variability the better you're going to perform perform so find out where that base heart rate is through your exhalation and control pause and you've basically found out what biofeedback is as you put the breath in front of that team of sled dogs as you make it the alpha dog you have control over your heart rate as you have control over your heart rate you have control over your athletic performance that's the simplified version but if you want to dramatically want to improve your performance understanding the numeric the numerical values behind it you'll be able to manipulate it even farther and that's I stumbled upon this uh, it's 
it's an invaluable technique to my clients now. Uh, just understand the first and most critical aspect is your maximum heart rate. This is a, this is a generalization. So if you take 220 minus your age, let's say you're 20 years old, then 200 would be your maximum heart rate. That's your generalization. It's not very accurate. But if you, there, there are much more accurate formulae out there like 217 minus your age times 0 0.85. And there are even more accurate formulae from that. But just generically, 220 minus your age will equal your maximum heart rate. What happens is, for people that don't have the appropriate type of conditioning or move into an event that's new to them or they face a sudden uh, crisis, they face a, uh, an opponent that makes them feel overwhelmed, if they feel they're outclassed, they're outmatched. This is why the, the psychological, psychological and emotional game is so critical. If you feel like you've made a mistake and you can't recover from your mistake, if you're behind the, the, the hammer, and you're falling farther and farther and farther behind. This is all controllable from our, from our breath. What happens is our heart rate jumps. If it goes over to max heart rate, let's say you're the 20-year-old athlete and your maximum heart, maximum heart rate should be 200. Once it crests 200, then your central nervous system takes over. It doesn't like what's happened. It views this as a threat. And then your reflex takes over. Then your nervous system hijacks your central nervous system, hijacks your control, your voluntary control, pushes you into the passenger seat and takes over driving. It releases certain chemicals, neuropeptides, neurotransmitters that tell the endocrine system to start cooking. This is a problem. So it starts squeezing on your glands. It starts squeezing on your adrenal system. So it starts dumping all of this uh, uh, super fuel into your bloodstream. But that epinephrine, that adrenaline, once it's in your system, it causes a whole array of uncontrollable um, byproducts. That's fine. If you were in a crisis, if you were in a car wreck, or if you, were, uh, if you had no skills as, a, as an athlete or as a fighter, and suddenly you were thrust into, to say, a self-defense situation, this is, this, is a, this is a genetic gift to have that chemical cocktail dumped into your bloodstream. But as a highly skilled athlete, as a high uh, performance engine, if you were to have jet fuel dumped into your gas tank, it's most likely going to burn hot and fast, but then explode. Because for a survival reflex, just surviving the next minutes, what's important, not your career longevity and not winning the match, not having access to these refined skills. If your heart rate jumps above maximum, your nervous system assumes that your skills are not sufficient. Your skills are not good enough to handle this. So I need to take over and give you these basal reflexes. That's not a reflection on your skill. It's just what your nervous system decides. It's a reflection on your conditioning. You can be an elite athlete conditioned for the wrong fight, prepared for the wrong event ready for the wrong mountain, and then thrust into that situation, your nervous system hijacks and takes over. When you have that flood of chemicals in your system, you can, you can have auditory exclusion. This host of uh, uh, chemical phenomena that happens, auditory exclusion is where you can't hear anything uh, if but one thing. Let's say you can only hear uh, the wrong thing like your opponent's coach, telling him exactly what your opponent needs in order to defeat you. Instead of you being able to hear the, not only your coach, but also the referee. That's all just cleared out. Uh, you can have visual exclusion too, which we call tunnel vision. Uh, you can only see the one portion of your opponent or one portion of the um, the court, the field, the ring, the octagon, whatever it be. The problem with that is you need to have, to be able to pan across everything. If you're focused down on one thing, that's a problem. The reason that developed genetically, we needed the ability to fixate on what the threat is. So everything zooms in and we get blinders on and just focused on that one thing. 
that's fine in lieu of no skill, but because of your high degree of skill, if your heart rate goes above maximum, you're only going to be able to focus on one thing at a time. You get fixated on trying to attack the, the one technique or trying to counter the one thing. And by the time you go to counter that thing that's already transpired, your opponent's several steps down the road. So as your heart rate goes above max, tunnel vision happens. And there's a whole, a whole slew of um, psychological phenomena that happen. Weird things like tachypsychia, where your, your uh, time either slows down or it speeds up. You feel like you're moving through molasses while your opponent is moving at the speed of light. All of those uh, phenomena can be avoided by keeping your heart rate underneath maximum. To do that, we can understand biofeedback will have an impact on that. So the first thing that uh, I found is by improving recovery heart rate in between rounds or, in be or after performance of training or after performance of your actual event, improving how fast you recover from maximal heart rate will start to have a transferable impact uh, into actual performance. So, and what I mean by recovery heart rate, how fast your, your heart rate recovers down from maximum heart rate determines how well you perform. So if, you, if your heart rate is 200, you're that 20 year old athlete, and your max heart rate is 200, let's say you're, you're, you begin conditioning in the reset, with a reset technique and you're, you're starting, your resting heart rate is 80 beats per minute. Your functional heart reserve is 200 minus 80, so 120. You have 120 beats to play with, right? How fast you recover down to that resting heart rate determines how well you can remain in access to 100% of your skills. And I've said this uh, many times that my goal as a coach is to give you 100% access to your skills for 100% of the fight. To do that, you need to stay underneath max. We can do that by manipulating your breath. I found that initially, uh, I was just recovering, the recovering down out of max. So once they learned the technique, my athletes were, in one case, uh, the average, uh, my, my athlete was recovering his heart rate 60 beats uh, in 30 seconds. Now that may not mean anything to you until you understand that the average athlete recovers his heart rate 19 beats per minute in 60 seconds. So if using the reset technique, you're recovering your heart rate in 60 beats per minute in 30 seconds, you have six times the recovery rate as your opponent. You recover six times faster than your opponent. Now you may, you may think, well, you know, that's going to require an inordinate amount of time. This is just adding one minute of practicing this technique in between rounds, one minute. So instead of just standing there and trying to catch your breath before you do your next conditioning bout of five minutes, you're practicing this recovery technique. So you're, you're not adding anything, you're just taking that one minute of complete rest, which does you absolutely no good, and implementing the reset technique. You'll find that you're recovering your heart rate so much faster. Once you've practiced that technique sufficiently, there's another very strange, very important phenomenon that's going to happen. Your nervous system will start to recover in anticipation of rest. I'll say that again. Your nervous system will cause you to recover in anticipation of a rest period coming. If you train specific for an event, let's say your title shot is five five minute rounds with 60 seconds break in between. And you've trained, let's just say absolutely specific, you've trained your conditioning for five five minute rounds with one minute of rest in between. At around four minutes, maybe four minutes, 30 seconds, your heart rate will start to drop as you start to accelerate in performance. What typically happens? Right, as the round goes on, you start to go down you start to decelerate and start to break and start to move through the sludge and the molasses. Well, what, what I found through implementing this technique is that my fighters were accelerating through the round, accelerating to the end and improving in performance while they were recovering. 
If you continue that, if you continue to practice that so that your nervous system is now rewiring in anticipation of rest, what will happen is during the fight, you're recovering wherever and whenever possible. So let's say you, you have that collision. There's an exchange, there's a volley, and just as you back up, your body's already recovering. It's heart, your heart rate is dropping so that you're improving in accuracy and performance. You're not trying to catch your breath. Your nervous system has taken over because you've rewired it. So with biofeedback, the first and most critical aspect of this is taking control of maximum heart rate so that once you crest above that, then you can drop beneath that. How do you do that? Well, you need technology. You need some technology. I never uh, go cheap on my athletes. I, I try and get the most expensive and mo most uh, accurate equipment possible. Um, I'm not here to sell you a heart monitor, so the, the, the type is not important. The quality is important. If you have the right band that won't slip or move on your athlete and, or on yourself, that it can detect what the heart rate is consistently, regardless of whether you're grappling or striking or doing MMA or in, in your conditioning, and most importantly in your conditioning, then when you hit maximum heart rate, when you hit your maximum heart rate, this will beep. And if it beeps, you have that conditioning bell, the operant conditioning. So you hear the beep and you know, okay, I need to back off, I need to get my heart rate down. You think, well, I have to perform more. You know, as an athlete, that's the first, the first uh, response to this. Well, no, I'm in a crisis. I need, right now you're conditioning. Right now you're sparring. This is, you're not wearing this while you're fighting. You don't need to do anything but listen to the beep. If your heart rate's over max, you're not performing, your central nervous system is. If your heart rate's over max, you need to take back control of that team of sled dogs. Put breath in the alpha dog and don't sit back and let somebody else steer you. That's just a reflex, it's not your skill. If you want your skill, you need to take control again. So as soon as it starts to beep at above your maximum heart rate, you start your exhalation process of getting beneath that maximum heart rate. And when it beats again, like in between rounds, when you get down to your recovery heart rate, which you've plugged in, you know it's time, you know you've re fully recovered, you're fully restored, and it's time to go again. You'll find that the more that you do this, the more that you follow and implement the reset technique into your general metabolic conditioning cycle, the faster that you're going to move from maximum heart rate to your recovery heart rate and get back into the next round. This is simple conditioning just like Pavlov's dog. So if you hear the bell, if you've been doing it in your conditioning, you'll start to decrease. So it, what I found is that over time, this is, it's, you don't become dependent upon the technology. The technology gives you an awareness of what's going on in your body. You can feel your, your blood pounding. So when you feel you're getting close to maximum heart rate, your nervous system has been rewired because of the reset technique so that you instantly start to start to go through this this reset technique to recover your heart rate it's the sensation of getting close to maximum heart rate which starts to drop you down that's why it requires two two to four months of consistent practice now you can right away right away see instant results but those re results need to latch in you have to rewire the entire system. That's going to take time. It's operant conditioning. It takes time to create this good habit of knowing what your maximum heart rate is and knowing what your recovery rate is and getting down there as fast as possible if you want six times the recovery rate as your opponent. In most sports, but especially in mixed martial arts and submission fighting, recovery is king. Whoever recovers faster is going to win. Now, there are other phenomena that are also attached to it, like your functional heart reserve, which as you practice this, you'll find that your resting heart rate decreases. So let's say you started your training at, with a resting heart rate of 80 beats per minute. By removing those uh, excessive uh, tension structures in your body through the vibration technique, you know, you excite the Golgi tendon organ and you, uh, the sensory receptors, the muscle spindles start to relax more and allow you to have that, that stretch reflex faster. What you'll find is that your resting heart rate drops. So let's say it drops 20 beats per minute. So 
within two weeks is typical, is average for my fighters. To my athletes will come in, they have a resting heart rate of 80 or 90 beats per minute, it drops down to around 50 or 60. Um, now their functional heart rate is much larger. The degree that they get to operate in from their maximum heart rate to their resting heart rate is much larger. So if, it, if your typical resting heart rate is 120 beats per minute, uh, you, you come in at um, uh, 80 beats per minute and your maximum heart rate is, is, is 200 and you drop down 30 beats per minute. Now your functional reserve from 50 beats per minute to 200 is 150. That much more performance is available to you, a fifth more. Once you understand how to increase your functional heart reserve, not only do you recover faster, but you have more, uh, more of a continuum of performance available to you. These three aspects, your breathing, your vibration, and the biofeedback all work to synergize and create the reset technique. In the next section, I'll introduce the technique to you in its components and practice them in the components that I present them to you because this is the way I found it to work. Until you've mastered this technique, I promise you, all, most of the ideas unless I'm missing something, most of the ideas have been tested, tried, and found wanting. This organization is optimal for producing the results that I've produced. And if you want those results, practice the techniques and make sure that you understand each component before moving on. There are five components to the reset technique. The most critical, and the reason that this is first, is the realignment there are both a psychological and a physiological component to realignment. I'll start with the psychological. I call it the predator posture because my, my emphasis is obviously mixed martial arts and submission fighting, but that's not the, the only reason. It's because of how we're, we're hardwired. If the, this posture is tied into, it's genetically wired into our recognition pattern because the only true predator to our species is itself. Humans are our most dangerous predators. Even in the dark, even at long ranges, we can detect this posture. We can recognize the, the human posture out of nothing. And as soon as we recognize that, our arousal systems start to alarm. So the, there's a genetic intimidation factor to it. Uh, if, if we detect a threat, the first thing that happens is the central nervous system hijacks, takes over, and starts sending chemical messengers out to tell the, the endocrine system, okay, here's a threat, we need some extra juice, and it releases that jet fuel into our bloodstream. It does the chemical cocktail dump into our bloodstream and gives us that epinephrine-like surge. And as soon as that surge happens, what what occurs. That's great if in lieu of no skill, but you are a highly refined athlete. When you have that chemical dump into your system, it hijacks your ability to, to have 100% access to your skills. Because with that chemical surge in your system, it starts to deteriorate your performance, impact your, your um, your accuracy, because as the blood, you know, this vasoconstriction, the blood squeezes out and pulls back and shifts the large muscles. So when you need fine motor control, your your hands feel like clubs. They don't, they don't, you don't have the accuracy that you need for the sweet science that is your sport. Now you can use this to a, an advantage when you adopt this, you know, in between each round, in between each exchange, in between, and not just. For, for your opponent's sake, but for your own sake, in between each conditioning round, in between each conditioning exercises, you never end on your knees. You always remain standing. At the end of it, you know, no matter how tired you are, you get up. You get up. You stand up and you realign. There's a, psycho a strong psychological component to this that is, that is purely biochemical and genetic. So by getting up and realigning right away, you're not only sending a signal to your own body to not dump down, is if you drop fetal, for instance, if you drop fetal, if you collapse down, if you're on your hands and knees, if you're laying in your own pool of sweat, 
then your body recognizes this as a threat. You're in danger. It needs to supercharge your system. You don't have, you're telling your nervous system, you don't have the skills, help me out. So get up, tell your nervous system you do have the skills and what else will you tell? As soon as you adopt that posture, you have, depending upon your opponent, depending upon if he's using the reset technique or uh, is properly coached uh, on top of using this type of breath control, you're sending a direct message, not to your opponent's uh, forebrain, but directly to uh, the, the, the root, to his uh, visceral emotional system, that you're a threat. And as soon as you psych out your opponent, this isn't like, it's not psychobabble. It's a purely a biochemical battle that you've just engaged in. By psyching out your opponent, you encourage his nervous system, his central nervous system, to release chemical messengers to send, to release hormones in the endocrine system. Dumping down that, that chemical dump and he goes into fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Once he does, he doesn't have access to his skills. That's what you're trying to do. You're not fighting your opponent, you're, you're, you're partnering, you're allying yourself with his nervous system. So by adopting this posture, by sending out that message that you're completely relaxed, that you're completely aligned, that you're completely prepared, his nervous system joins with you and says, look, this guy is a threat. I don't care what you think your skills are, you don't, you're not prepared for him. And he dumps down all of that chemical into his bloodstream and doesn't have access to those skills. So no matter how skilled he is, no matter if he's your, your, if he's superior to you, technically, if your conditioning is superior to his, it doesn't matter what his technique is, he won't have access to it. The second aspect of the, re, the, the realignment is the physiological component. Let's say you're about to do the breathing technique. If you're your chin's drop down and you're on your hands and knees or you're crouched down and you're bent over, your lungs don't have full expansive capability. You can't bring in the full tidal volume. So there's a physiological component to being, being able to have access to this technique. You need to be able to open up the chest cavity. You need to be able to have full alignment. The more that your body, not, in, not only just in the, the, the iron, the encasement of your lungs, but also in the alignment of your body, the more it's fully aligned, the more that it's standing erect, the more anti-gravitational it is. So if you're crouched over, if you're bent over, if you're fallen over, what happens is you have all of this excess tension holding you up where you should be hung like a marionette. You're hung from the ceiling and everything falls down effortlessly underneath, defying gravity. The more that you're crouched over and bent over, the more your shoulders are rolled, the more your head's hung, the less that you can relax and actually recover. It takes more energy to be bent over like that fetal than it does to stand up erect. It just takes more energy and effort psychologically and emotionally to get back to that state because when you're, when you're at the edge of your conditioning or when you're past maximum heart rate, it's purely will and, and habit that will get you back underneath maximum heart rate, will, will get you back to full realignment. Once you understand the, the realignment, then after each exercise, after each round, and eventually, like, this, like I said before, this will leach over into your actual performance. Even in the execution of your, your actual sport, you'll start to realign. You'll start to carry yourself taller, like this mountain pose. So we'll go into the technique, the physical technique of finding realignment uh, next, but most importantly, you have to implement this not just, in, not just in one place, but all the time. You need to start thinking that you know practice begins when your session ends, so that you carry this into everything that you do. We'll begin with the predator posture, and I'll explain each of the components to realignment. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create this anti-gravitational posture so that you can reintegrate your breath with your alignment, your open alignment, allowing you to breathe with the least amount of tension possible. So when I describe the components, think of being hung from the ceiling, and that's the most important part. Uh, in Alexander Technique, it's called primary control. Your head's the most important part. Where the head goes, the body follows. So crown is the 
top of your head, not the middle of your head. Right on top of your spine, you're trying to lift that up toward the ceiling. As you lift this directly up, you're bringing your chin down. And you're not tucking your chin, which will round your head forward. You're keeping your chin down so that as you lift up, you're not trying to tilt your chin up. We tend to, because we're binocular and we're predators, when we say lift up, we tilt up to try and get our, our eyes in vision. So you're trying to lift the top of your spine. That slides your head back slightly, chin down. I'll explain each of the components in detail and then I'll give you a very simple cadence of follow. Then to counter that, crown up, chin down, your shoulders press straight down. Initially what people do uh, is because of conditioning and because of being predators, um, we tend to over inflate. We give the appearance of the alignment without actually realigning. So when I say drive your shoulders down, most people will pinch their shoulders back in order to lift their, their heart up. But that drives you out of alignment and cause, it causes more tension. So you're trying to lift your crown up, chin down, drive your shoulders straight down. To make sure your shoulders are dr driven straight down, you're pressing your elbows down toward the outsides of your knees. So you're reaching your fingers down to the outsides of your knees. We'll go down there in just one second. That allows your chest to lift up. Most of our breath is limited because we don't allow our ribs to open up. These are designed to open up like big French bay doors. So the more that we cave forward, the more that we have imbalanced chain, the training, like if we do too much um, anterior chain work, if we do too much bench press, our shoulders roll forward, right? We get that forward roll, that forward flexion, and that limits our breath. So our heart has to work harder if we have to breathe shallower and more frequent. So our conditioning builds into this. If you're too forward and you can't get your chest back up, driving your shoulders down, that means you have to do more posterior work so that your shoulders can come down and drive straight down, allowing your chest to open up, which gives your, your lungs full tidal volume when you're about to do the tune-up, the breathing, and the reboot. Once your chest is available to lift up by driving your shoulders down, you'll find that there's traction. You can separate your neck. You can lift your crown up while driving your shoulders down in two equal and opposite motions. You'll need that because as you slide forward and adopt more of a prey posture here, you're going to cut off your lungs and you're going to increase your heart rate, which decreases your performance once you jump heart rate max. So crown up, chin down, shoulders dri driven down, chest up but not shoulders pinched back. From there, we're gonna move down lower. And this is what's gonna open up our breath and our diaphragm. Our hips will drive forward. We're gonna lock our glutes. We're gonna squeeze our glutes forward because most of us, because of so much forward flexion, have muted hip function. We can't actually snap our hips and get fully locked out forward because of training imbalances, and because of postural distortions that happen from those training imbalances. So hips forward. To keep our hips forward, we're going to take our thighs and squeeze them back to lock out our knees. Once our knees are locked out, we're going to take all of this, all of this structure upstairs, and we're going to pull it back until we're midfoot balance. Not up here on the balls of our feet, forefoot. Not back on our heels, falling back, but in the middle, but with your hips forward. Usually what happens because of muted hip function, because of tight, tight hip flexors, we, when we say go back, this is what happens. Lead with the, the tailbone. You want to keep your hips forward, knees locked, and then pull back to midfoot balance. Now that sounds like a lot, and it is. Standing is difficult for most people. Standing upright, most anti-gravitational, and it takes some people, it will take a long time because of years of conditioning where your posture has been so distorted that just your very carriage throughout your day is a taxing uh, effect on your heart. So we have to rebalance and bring this realignment into play, not just in, not just in stance, but in conditioning as well, so that you can regain that, that uh, anti-gravitational posture. Now, to, to recap, you're going to be doing this in between each session. You're going to do this right after your, your rounds are over. You're gonna try and do this in between rounds, like as you move from one exercise to the next, or from one opponent to the next, one training partner to the next, you need to regain, you need to get up, you need to get off your knees, you need to stand up. Don't 
allow yourself the luxury of crawling to the next opponent. You need to psychologically program yourself and deprogram your opponent. So crown up, chin down, shoulders pressed into the earth, hips forward underneath your shoulders, knees locked underneath your hips, pull everything back to midfoot balance underneath your knees for realignment. The second component to the reset technique is to tune up. This is specifically where we start to implement vibration training into the application of the breath with the alignment. So we've already realigned. You've adopted that predatory posture, that mountain pose in yoga. Next, what we're going to do is look at how vibration allows us to resynchronize and allows us to, like a tuning fork, reharmonize so that we can release all of the residual tension on the body. Now, there's no such thing as being completely relaxed. It's a myth. Uh, you can't totally be relaxed because we live in a gravitational field and if you were to totally relax, well, then we turn into a puddle of goo because the, the body is what geeks call uh, a tensegrity structure. It's a sea of continuous tension pulling in to hold our integrity against hard compressive struts, the bones pushing out. And that balance is what keeps us upright, gives us the ability to have locomotion and to perform our sports. It's a magical uh, structure that we, is just beyond comprehension still. So we, we like to call it a myofascial matrix. Uh, but you can look at it that, like a paperclip. If you were to bend a paperclip back and forth, the more that you bend it, uh, finally the, the heat that's generated from, from that friction will, will snap it in half. It'll, it'll get hot enough that it'll break. Well, without releasing that residual tension, that's what happens to our body. Over time, that's, that's a horrible it's horrible for postural distortion. Like if you look at our, our friend here, in this model, if I were to press down on his shoulder, now it impacts the rest of his body, not just locally, but in particular if you look how right at the, the top of the lumbar spine, at the bottom of the, the thoracic, how it causes compression, it causes stretching. The, when you impact one part of the body, you impact the entire body. And the vibration technique is like a reset button, hence the name. We're trying to allow that anti-gravitational effect to kick in right away by reharmonizing so that there's no excess heat being expended. Like remember at the beginning, I told you this will increase your energy and it will increase your energy because your normal level of energy, your normal level of energy is so much more vast than you believe it is. For me, what I find both sad and humorous is that when a new client comes to me, the first thing that I'm going, the most important thing that I could give them is a week off to start with. A week from a complete break from training so that they, they can allow their nervous system to just shut down and reboot and start over. And we'll get into the reboot technique in a second, but there's so much residual tension and so much and that they're, they're so under restored that they gain immediate and massive results from this almost instantly. In some cases completely instantly. In some cases after one session. So the whole purpose of vibration is once you've ad adopted the realignment, then we're going to systematically work from head to, head to toe and shake loose all of that residual tension. And we're going to do this the low-tech way. You can also, with uh, proper instruction and proper coaching, use the high-tech route uh, though, you know, it's like a fourteen to $18,000 power plate so that you can vibrate the entire body and cause the, the antagonistic uh, activation to shut down and release. That's great in your conditioning, but you don't have access to that kind of technology when you're about to fight, when you're in between rounds, when you're training in, uh, on your own at different camps, and most importantly, in the midst of a fight. The benefit of this low-tech version of this tune-up that I'm about to show you is that you can take it anywhere. It's equipment free. You can do it all the time with no residual training effect. You, you're not going to cause an adaptation that is, is at, uh, adverse at this point. 
So take it with you, practice it, implement it all the time. As soon as you get realignment, then you're going to hit the tune-up. Now in the tune-up, I'm going to keep my throat open. I'm not going to go into the breathing technique yet uh, because I want to show how the structure changes first. So, so most importantly, pay attention to the vibration that's being caused at this point, at this point. And then we'll discuss in the next component the technique of breathing with the reboot. So you found realignment. Crown up, chin down, shoulders pressed into the earth, hips forward underneath the shoulders, squeezing the glutes, squeezing the thighs back, knees locked underneath the hips, pull everything back, midfoot balance underneath the knees. So you've adopted that predatorial posture. Now it's time to shut down any residual tension, any excess energy expenditure. You first do that by creating a chug with your legs. And the chug is to send these four joints of the shoulders off of the rib cage. You bounce them off, and by bouncing them off, you allow the vibration to wave down throughout the body. And you also open up the lungs, which we'll discuss in a second with the, the, the breathing technique of rebooting. So first you created the chug. Now this was very disconcerting on the first time I stepped across the mat from the Soviet wrestlers. And they were preparing by just <laughs> vibrating on the edge of the mat. It has a psychological component to it. it. It does have an intimidation factor. However, the most important part is that you're not doing it to intimidate your opponent. Your opponent. That will happen. You're doing it to relax residual tension in your body. So I'll, I'll show you the first and most important part, which is the chug off the, the legs. You still need to maintain chin down, crown up. Your throat's open. You're not holding your breath. Now, you can do this. Now, that's just the, 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 the basic from realignment. But you can do this posture-specific or sport-specific. So if you're in your fighting stance, you're back at your ring corner, you've, you've, or you've hit a collision and you've backed off, you shake off, you, know, you shake it off. It's, it's intuitive. We've done this for millennia. All, all creatures do it. All mammals do it. They twitch to release any residual tension so that it doesn't launch into their hormonal cascade. Their, those chemicals in the body. So if you get the chug in the legs, even if it's position specific, you're allowing the shoulders to drop and cause a vibration to follow down like a tuning fork throughout the rest of your body. Now, it can be posi position specific, but when you're practicing it, you want to, in your conditioning, at the end of the round or at the end of the session, you also want to include the full drop, the full collapse. When you're collapsing down, you're, I'm going to try and talk through it, but know that when I'm talking through it, that my voice is going to change. You're going to hear the vibration in my vocal cords as it changes as I collapse over. So the first is you get the chug with the legs. The shoulders drop down. Chin drops down. Shoulders roll forward. Now you're sending the vibration up between your shoulder blades. Keep the chug going. As you go down, mid-back's rounding. Now you're sending the vibration to your lower back. Keep the head hanging loose. There's no tension in the head, it's just hanging straight down. Arms are completely relaxed. Keep sending the chug down farther. As you get closer and closer to belly and thighs, fingers dropping down, completely relaxed, you wanna drift here. Then as you inhale up, drive midfoot balance. Midfoot presses mid back toward the ceiling. Hips roll over top of your knees. Shoulders roll back over top of your hips. Crown back towards the ceiling, chin down. And you want to do that five to ten times. This is between sessions or at the end of your session. It's, you, you won't have the time to do this in between rounds. That's not what I'm saying. This is a different full, full tune-up. The full tune-up you do when you have the time to do it. The partial tune-up. I don't want to get into the breathing yet, but that's when you only have a few seconds to do it. And a few seconds is all you need. A partial tune-up can give you a recovery of 60 beats per minute in 30 seconds if you do it correctly and if you practice it consistently. So again, I'll do it without talking. I'm back, crown up, chin down, shoulders pressed down, hips forward underneath the shoulders, knees locked underneath the hips. Pull everything back, midfoot balance underneath the knees for your first vibration technique, the collapse. 
where the first tune-up, the collapse, can be done both partial and full, so can the second technique, the, the shimmy, partial and full. When you do it position specific, it'll look a, a lot familiar to you if you, if you have uh, a mixed martial art background. The shimmy, when done just standing, can look a little odd because it takes some practice. But if you tie it into like your boxing shoe shiner, uh, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see that you've been practicing this unknowingly. Okay? So the first technique is throwing the shoulders back and forth and throwing the hips back and forth. And that gets the lateral and diagonal vibration that you need. So it's sending it from one shoulder to the opposite foot, opposite shoulder to the opposite foot. As you send it, I'm gonna keep my throat open. I'm gonna try and not get into the breathing aspect of it yet, but know that you're going to hear the changes in breath happen. So the first technique, the shimmy, is the shoulders come forward and it almost looks like a, a dancing movement. But the hips are leading the generation to cause the shoulders to shimmy back and forth. And there's an ancient exercise, uh, a Tai Chi exercise, where as your arms are draped, you're swinging at the waist and hitting particular points on meridians. That's not my background, but this is pan-cultural. It's throughout cultures that they've used this type of vibration training. For the, for the Soviets, their main concern was performance enhancement, so that's my lineage. When I'm doing it, it's, it's mostly to shake out the residual tension, like you're wringing on a washcloth. Now, if you do it position specific, let's say that you're a, a frontal fighter, like you, you, you fight squared off. When you fight squared off, you can eventually see where that leads into your shoe shiner action, where you're working on back and forth, vibrating, so that your body shimmies back and forth and you're working, the, you're working your bag, right? That will help you siphon from one lung to the next as you work diagonally. Uh, the last exercise, if I stretch my arms long, as I stretch my arms long and roll a shoulder over, and roll back. Those of you that are already familiar with circular strength training will recognize that as the arm screw. But I'm gonna try and open this up so that you can hear the impact on my breath. This is an exercise the arm screw is for after training as a, as a way of releasing the vibration in more of a ringing effect. So as you drop over, Just by opening the throat, you don't need to breathe. You are being breathed by the ringing-like effect out of it. So the second tune-up can be done partial or full. You're full. It's all the way down the body. You can also do a partial tune-up. It's just the work to shake out the tension, a position specific, which has very much value. And then finally, you can do a full range exercise just to allow the lungs to siphon back and forth for your second tune-up, the shimmy. Your final technique on the tune-up is with your appendages, your arms and your legs. These will look very familiar. Uh, some of them will look very familiar, but the depth and the purpose and the intent are very specific. Like I said, this is a simple technique, but its applications have much wider uh, impact than initially thought of. The first, I, I call it a dice shaker, like if you're holding a, a pair of dice in your hands and you're shaking your arm. We carry so much tension up through the upper arm and into the shoulders that it starts to irradiate down into our forearms. So when your, your arms get really tired and full and thick, that's when you need to shake them out. And you can do this in between your conditioning session. You can start low, and if you see, you're trying to keep this as loose as possible. The more that you loosen it up, the more that the vibration starts to break up the chunks of bound tension throughout the shoulders, and then you can see how it's starting to wave down through the rest of the body. As you start to bring this upward, you can see how it sends vibration all the way down into the lat so that you can start to open up the posterior chain 
through your dice shaker. Keep it low and then work it high. Both arms. And you can do this immediately between your position specific work. So even if you back out, you know, you're, you're carrying your gloves and those are just mere ounces, but you know this as a competitor over time, they feel like lead. So by shaking up into the upper arms and shoulders and then across finally to the girdle, that'll help you relax back into place so that there's nothing but structure holding this up rather than just all muscle. Because as the more muscle that gets involved, the more it flares out, the more you get tired. It's a vicious cycle. So you're shaking out. Get your dice shaker. Obviously, you can't do the hand the handshake, but you can do this practice not carrying tension in your hands when you're conditioning, when you're not wearing your wraps or your gloves. Because the more that these get tight, the, the your your fist is a great contributor to it is your forearm. So the tighter your fist, the more that comes up into your forearm, the more it carries and irradiates farther and farther. So by shaking out your hands and getting used to that, not just the dice shaker, but your hands. the more you'll be able to send the vibration up higher and higher into your body. And then finally, your legs. Uh, your legs, we've all, we've, we've heard of shaking out the legs. Like we, when we shake out the legs, we don't put a lot of heart into it. You're trying to lock out the knee and bend it, lock out the knee and bend it by kicking the heel into the ground and pulling the toes back towards the shin. As you do this, the thigh gets to become loose and the hamstring starts to loosen up because we carry so much residual tension all the way up into the glutes. The looser it becomes, the more that we can remove that, that heat from bending the paper clip back and forth. We're trying to remove all of that excess energy expenditure and increase the reactivity of the tissues so that once they become loose, <laughs> we've loosened up the arms, now we can actually go to full contractile potential. So in this final technique, remember that you can do it individually as a cool down, right? In between rounds, in between your conditioning, but you can also do it position specific. So just one or two shakes is really going to have a dramatic impact as it crosses over into your physical performance, your sport. And your final tune up is your face. Now, the reason that the face is so important is, is as you clench your teeth, it irradiates into everything. The, if, if you've heard the old saying, if you wanna be happy, smile, it implies that what you do with your face controls the rest of your body. It's just like, biofeedback in that if, if I'm so tense and grinding down, the rest of my body is going to follow suit. And I don't want that chemical dump. So if you look at all of the masterful fighters, to them, it's like they're going out for a day of surfing. For them, the face is completely ra relaxed. And it was the first technique that we were taught in Russia, uh, that your face has to be completely relaxed. They, were, they would rub the face down, they'd wipe the ears across, and that you want to remove all that residual tension. All of these lines on the forehead need to drop down and be completely nonchalant so that you don't distort any of the rest, any of the, the muscular activation. That's easier said than done. And it, this is gonna take some time. Um, one of the techniques I saw when, when first facing the, the, the Soviet fighters was that they were slapping the face in order to bring blood flow to the top. Because the, if, you, if you've been in a type of street fight, the, one of the telltale signs is that the blood drops away and the, the person looks gaunt for a second as the blood flow shifts to their... To their um, large large tissues to their large muscles. Same thing with fear. As the, you, looks, they look like they saw a ghost, their, their face goes white, right, as the blood flow drains out. So that sign means that a face is being distorted. If you bring the blood flow to the surface, you, you're sending a command signal to the rest of the, the super system, to your nervous system, to your endocrine system, and even to your immune system. So the way to do that, another way besides the slapping, which you know, we, we, we all do, we, we give ourselves some juice so that we, we're ready, we, we're, we're prepared, is to shake the face. 
and it can be a little disconcerting at first. I'll show you the exercise. Your most important part is your jowls. You're trying to keep these completely loose. The looser that they are, the easier that this will become because your eyes and your forehead will reciprocate. The more that you can release the jowls, the more it will irradiate into the rest of your head and all the way down your neck. So the face shake. As much as possible, and you can hear that the jowls, when they, when they gain distance, they, they get completely relaxed. The more that the face is relaxed, the more that the rest of the body, it's a reset button, the more the rest of the body can relax. So the last one, the most important one, is the face shake. I, I save it for last because, I mean, this is something that you can do in your corner. Even if you're wearing headgear, you can manage to do this. so that you can go systematically through the rest of your body, get the shake all the way out, get the rest of the residual tension, and now we'll move on to applying that with breathing in our reboot technique. So now we're at the third component to the reset button, and that is our reboot. Our reboot is the recovery breath, how fast and we use this to quickly recover our breath in between rounds, in between training sessions, in between exercises, in between collisions or volleys. You're using this breathing exercise and it will eventually rewire your nervous system so that you're using it all the time. It's a sharp exhalation that's deliberate. You're actively doing an exhalation and it's a passive inhalation. You're not trying to inhale. So it's not, <laughs> you don't want to actively inhale at all. The lungs are passive. They're a sponge. So as you squeeze the fluid out of them, that tidal volume is sucked back in just by relaxing. This is great because as you squeeze out the air, the only thing that you're working on is exhalation. So you're bringing down your heart rate through activation rather than... So if your muscles are working to inhale, your heart rate and blood pressure get a double, double hit. Not only are you inhaling and bracing, but you're using energy in order to breathe. You're using conscious inhales. We're gonna use conscious exhales, and we're going to allow passive, meaning relaxing to cause the inhale. That'll keep our heart rate as low as possible. So when we squeeze, we squeeze here. You can hardly hear the inhale. The inhale is that back pressure as the volume is sucked back in. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> you can barely hear it, but you can hear the sharp exhalation, and it's not throaty. When a person first hears this, a client might do this. <laughs> it's very throaty. And you can tell the, if you're getting the proper depth by the tone of the exhale. Listen to how much lower this is, <laughs> as opposed to, it's much higher up here when it's throaty. You wanna bring it down as low as possible. Eventually, we're gonna bring it all the way down to our diaphragm. <laughs> as we tilt the pelvis and allow the pressure to squeeze down and open up, allowing our diaphragm to give us our biggest breath. So it's an active exhalation. <laughs> the shoulders roll forward, so you're squeezing out the air around the clavicular level, around the, the top, just underneath your neck and your shoulders. Your shoulders roll forward and then relax back into realignment, you know, just like we talked about. And then the second is that you're folding forward around your ribs, around your intercostals as your ribs come in and compress mid-spine thoracic, pressing out the air. Finally, your tailbone tucks just slightly, and that allows the diaphragm to open up the most so that we can get the most amount of travel. <laughs> so that's the deepest breath. That's our technique. But we, the, the reboot technique isn't independent of the vibration technique. But when, when you practice the, the tune-up, just doing the collapse here, just a partial collapse. Now, if we add on the breathing component, the reboot is <laughs> 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 
And you would think that I would be out of breath from that, but you're not because it's the exhalation that you're focusing on. If you get out of breath, it's because of overusing muscles. It's from <laughs> which is the hyperventilation syndrome. Even just modeling that causes my heart rate to lift up and causes me to get a little flushed. So you're focusing on the exhalation. <laughs> I'm trying to do it slow, but the exhalation jostles all throughout the body as it fires down. So he's squeezing out. So the structure is also squeezing out the breath. And that's what you're doing in between rounds. Even in between exchanges, <laughs> you'll find that good boxers are throwing their breath through their, through their mouthpiece to exhale so that they can squeeze out in case they get counterpunched, so that their body completely roots so that they have the most amount of core activation. So you intuitively do this, but now you're doing it as a re specific recovery method so that you do it all the time so that your, your body isn't hijacked by your central nervous system when you get into aerobic debt. And that's where this really comes into play. Aerobic debt is when your muscles use more energy than you have at your disposal. So you're in debt. How do you get that back? Initially, you would think, well, I need to inhale. That's what happens, right? We try and inhale. We're, we're out of breath, so we... But all that does is make it worse. We have plenty of oxygen in here. What we don't have is the ability to bond it in our blood. We have to bond that hemoglobin. So without getting into the geek science of it, we need to exhale more. And that gives us more CO2 so that it captures in our bloodstream and bonds up more oxygen so that we have more at our disposal. We don't need to inhale more. So and you should be able to do that for your entire minute of recovery. The longer that you're able to do that, the more that you're going to drop down your heart rate and get underneath your maximum heart rate, recover faster than your opponent, release any residual tension, increase your energy as a result, and be prepared mentally. Because with pre-competitive anxiety or competitive anxiety, if you're actually in the event, or if you're using this for health reasons, for stress reasons, for stress release, the, the, same, the same result happens. The way to combat all of those chemicals that happen, that get dumped into your system from anxiety, is to cause exhalation to happen so that you can get your breathing as the alpha dog in front of the, the team of sled dogs. So, <laughs> face is getting relaxed, arms are getting relaxed, core is getting relaxed, legs are getting relaxed. This is how you reboot. And if the average fighter is getting a recovery rate of 19 beats per minute, the average conditioned fighter, the average conditioned fighter, if, if your heart rate's recovering under 12 beats per minute in a, uh, 12 beats in a minute, then you better get checked from a health professional. But the average conditioned fighter is recovering around 19 beats per minute. With this technique, I've gotten up to 60 beats per minute in 30 seconds just after a few sessions, I, three sessions. So six times the recovery rate of your opponent. It looks like a strange exercise. Implement it for four months, and I promise you, you'll come back thanking me for it. So. <laughs> is your reboot. You can apply this through the rest of your, your tune-up techniques. So if you're, even though I'm shaking my leg, even though my leg is what's being vibrated right now, that vibration is coming up into my core, up into my lungs. As it does, it even goes up into my face, the rest of my body. Obviously, if my leg can impact my breath, my face can impact my breath. So when you work on even your arms, and you're working down into your posterior chain, your face, the more that you can shake out that excess energy, the faster you're gonna recover, this is a reboot technique. It hits your nervous system, 
gives you the ability to start right away, but even though those, tech, those uh, results are immediate, you need them to be long lasting. Two to four months of practice, every single session, every single day. So you've realigned, you've tuned up, and you've rebooted. Now it's time to throttle up. Now, I teach the throttle up technique, this component, after my athletes have learned how to reboot. You will look at the throttle up and think, well, I'll just grab that technique and put it in now because it's gonna give me so much energy right away. It, yeah, it will. But unfortunately, if you don't do that, if you, if you take it out of context and you plug it in, all it's going to do is send your heart rate max above. And if you're above heart rate max, you'll feel like you're juiced up. You'll feel like you're ready to, ready to roll, but it's all chemical. It's not, you won't have 100% access to your skills for 100% of the fight. That's my call sign, that's what I believe in, it's what, the, it's what I guarantee to my, to my fighters. If you, if you wanna train this way, you have to first learn how to recover your heart rate first. If you can stay consistently under your heart rate max while performing, physically at your maximum, then it's time to hit this, this throttle up technique. You'll know that if you're recovering your heart rate to within 60 seconds, all the way down, then you know that you're ready to go. If you can recover your heart rate to 120 beats per minute, you know that you're ready to throttle up, but you have to use this, this judiciously. If you do it at night, you're gonna have problems sleeping. I've done, I've, not, I've done it and I know it. It will give you insomnia. If you do it during the middle of a fight, you're going to push yourself above heart rate max. That's not its goal. If you do it during your conditioning, you'll be ab above heart rate max. And this is, it's not just your performance that suffers when you're above heart rate, heart rate max. It's your conditioning that suffers. If your heart rate is above maximum while you're conditioning, you have no trainable effect from it. It is wasted work. That whole nonsense of push till you puke, the puke is because you've dumped so many chemicals into your system that it has to, it has to evacuate all of that fluid. It, has to, it wants to dump everything out because it feels like it has to get away from a life-threatening event. So you cannot use this in your conditioning e either. It's just as a warm-up technique to throttle up. Once the throttle's on, you're done. You don't use this technique anymore. I wanna say this one more time. If you use this while conditioning, it will get you more energy, but all it will do is give you chemical energy. That's not trainable. If you have 10 to 14 seconds of that chemical burn, uh, ATP PC, the, the alactic anaerobic energy system, if you have 10 to 14 seconds, which, you know, it's genetic, you don't get any more. You can't train to have more. So it will look like you're getting more energy, but all you're doing is you're pushing and wasting all of those critical chemicals. You want to, you want to be very judicious with those so that you use a microsecond here, a microsecond there in your fight. You want to use the, the reboot technique. <sighs> so that you can recover that ATP PC as much as possible, so that you're only dealing out a microsecond here, a microsecond there when you're, when you're launching your, your actual skills, when you need that just temp, temp, temporary chemical burn to supercharge your technique. You don't want to spend five seconds of that right now. You won't recover it in time. Throttling up is just to get your RPMs ready so that you can perform. The way I use this is, my athletes have about 20 to 40 minutes. Uh, well, all athletes have about 20 to 40 minutes before they step into the ring, before they step into their match. And typically, uh, the average athlete is back there just pounding the pads and drilling takedowns and working their sweeps and reversals. And what they're doing is expending energy. So when you're conditioning, what do you have to do? You have to condition for that as well. So that not only are you in condition for the fight, you're conditioned for the warm up. Now imagine if an athlete could come in and get his heart rate ready for the target zone. The target zone is, let's say, 65% of your heart rate max. If you can get up to that target zone without expending any muscular energy, wouldn't that be an advantage? Of course it would. So let's say your target zone is 120 beats per minute. Your, your, your uh, 
base heart rates, 80 beats per minute. Or let's say you've been using reset and it's down to 50 or 60 beats per minute. You need to get up to that 120. You do not want to enter into the ring. You do not want to start your fight cold. You don't want to be warming up in the first round while your opponent's already ready to go. So that's why people are in the back room, right? What if you could warm up without using that energy? What if you could use that 20 to 40 minutes of conditioning time over the months of your preparation dedicated to making yourself more powerful and more explosive with just the, the time period of actual fighting? Imagine how much more energy you would have. That's what the throttle up technique is for. So with my fighters, I can get their heart rate from base heart rate, say 50 beats per minute, up to 130 beats per minute their target zone in 60 seconds. That's what this technique's for. So you could do this on the way to the ring. As you're, as you're working your way in, you're working on the throttle up technique. You can do it when you're feeling like in extreme situations, when you feel like you, you're post fatigue, when you don't have any energy left, then in those, in those instances, which you won't be because you'll be conditioning the right way, you won't be in those situations where you'll be in lesser condition than your opponent. I won't allow it. You are going to train the right way and you'll have the conditioning superior to your opponent. However, in those rare situations, then you can use the throttle up to get yourself a little bit of a chemical burn that will last you the rest of the fight. Please use it judiciously. Please use it ju judiciously. So the throttle up technique is an active exhalation with a passive inhalation. So it's like the, the reboot, which is <laughs> which is to accompany the vibration. But the, the throttle up, and when, if you think about it, if you see, it, like I did, standing across from an opponent doing this, it has a psychological intimidation factor. You exhale through the mouth. <sighs> as you lift into alignment, Crown up, chin down, shoulders pressed into the earth, hips forward underneath your shoulders, knees locked underneath your hips, midfoot balance underneath your knees. <laughs> I'm not, it, it sounds like a sniff, I know it does. It sounds like I'm doing that, but I'm not. I'm going to open my nose and without using any musculature, allow the air to rush back in. <laughs> All I'm doing is covering my mouth. As I cover my mouth, the air is forced to suck back in through the only orify that are open. So as long as I don't close my glottis, that air is going to be sucked back in. And this breathing technique, this is one that you definitely have to be cleared by your physician. Because it, if you do it incorrectly, if you do it with a precondition, you can trigger a hyperventilation feedback loop. You can go into something you don't want to do. So you have to get this technique clear. But once it is clear, once he says, well, you don't have any conditions, and you're not abusing the technique, go ahead. Then the technique is <laughs> That's how aggressive that you have to be with it. It's going to start to elevate your heart rate without dumping in and without consuming muscular energy. Once you get rapidity into it, <laughs> that's how rapid you want the breathing technique. <laughs> that sharp, it will increase, it's making me energized just standing here from the, from the 10 seconds that I demonstrated. You can do it position specific. You're in your, your stance, you're, you're, you're working on your positions specific drills. So you can work it in your position specific drills, but the most important fact is that you need to get this throttle up technique cleared by your doc to make sure that you have no conditions that would prevent you from performing it and practicing it. And you need to use it judiciously because although it will increase your heart rate and it will get you juiced up without expending muscular energy, you want to make sure that it's not tapping into your energy reserves, which you need to last you the entire fight. The final component, you've gone through your realignment, you've went into your tune-up, then into your reboot, practice throttling up after you've developed your reboot, and then finally it's time to idle down. Now, your reboot isn't sufficient to bring yourself 
low, which is what you need to do. This is what you want to practice at the end of the day and after your final session. So it's a great technique to do while you're lying in bed or before you go to bed. It's a great technique to do after your final session of the day so that you can completely calm it down. If you have six to eight hours in between sessions, then the, the idle down is a good technique so that you can go back into whatever you need to do for the day. Our goal now with the idle down is to increase our functional heart reserve. We're trying to actually get our base heart rate lower than what it currently is. So let's say if it's 60 or 70 beats per minute, the idle down will help you get it lower and lower. The reboot technique will help it to a degree, but idle down is the one that really cements it home so that you can be fully and completely relaxed. Now it's not possible to completely relax. Uh, that's just a physiological impossibility, but we want to remove as much superfluous tension as possible. This final technique uh, in yoga, it's called a corpse pose and they call it crocodile breathing. Uh, there are different breathing exercises that can be used my goal with the reset button is to simplify everything. What do you essentially need in order to accomplish these goals? How much do you need to know? This is all you need to know. This is the only exercise. There is a wealth of information in yoga and other disciplines for relaxation breathing. But this exercise is the one that I found that has the most universal, universally re repeatable and consistent results in it. Uh, and I call it square breathing. The reason I call it square breathing is because you're working on an equal duration through all four points of our breath. As you inhale up equal amount of time, as you're holding the inhale, as you're exhaling down, as you're controlling the pause before the inhale so that you create a square in your breath and you're practicing all four angles. Like the realignment horizontally, or vertically, you have a realignment horizontal. So I'll go through that first because most of us, corpse pose is known as the most difficult pose in yoga. And the reason for that is, is because when you're lying down, you have the most contact surface area with gravity. It's easier to be anti-easier, to be anti-gravitational when you're vertical. But as soon as you lie down, then there's so much more that you need to relax. So. I'll go through it, I'll talk through it while I'm doing it. You can practice it, but think of the, the idling down as focusing on the breath and relaxing, relaxing each joint from toe to your head, including your face and your tongue. So the first is to adopt the corpse pose, and that's bringing your heels together and letting your toes drop out. For a lot of people, it's really difficult to let their toes drop out to the sides. Their feet will point directly upward. You're trying to let your knees roll out, your calves roll out, letting your thighs turn out. As your thighs turn out, that allows your tailbone to slightly tuck just enough to regain that natural curve. And that allows your mid-back to go flat and your shoulders to roll down. As your shoulders roll back and down, that allows your upper arms to turn out. Your pinky fingers, you're trying to bring fingers curled naturally toward the, toward the ceiling, pinkies touching your thighs. If you have so much forearm tension from conditioning training effects or from trauma, you might not be able to do this initially. Don't try and strain your pinkies to your, your thighs. Just separate your arms until you can feel the back of your hands touch the ground. If you can though, try and keep your pinkies in so that you can allow that natural curve to relax your thumbs out. Finally, bring your chin down towards your chest and extend your crown back so that you can lengthen out your neck. You're trying to get your neck regaining its natural curve. So most of us, we lay down with our chin up. So chin down, crown back. Then finally, your face. Completely relax your lips. Relax your tongue off the back of your teeth to the back of your mouth. As soon as you do, you'll feel your ribs drop into place because most of that 
speaking tension that we constantly are on the verge of talking releases the musculature around our ribs and lets our ribs drift down. So dropping your tongue to the back of your mouth. Completely relax your cheeks. You don't need to grind your teeth anymore. So if your teeth slightly separate, that's okay. Completely relax your eyes, eyes closed. By relaxing your eyes, there's nothing to see. You can just concentrate on your breath. There's nothing to look at. Clear out that part of your brain. Completely relax your forehead. There's nothing to think about. We tend to get tense in our forehead because our forebrain is doing most of our creative thought, critical thinking. You don't have to think about anything more. We're moving to a more visceral, a lower part of our brain. We're moving to our breath. So you can give your forebrain a break. It's off duty now. So you've moved from heels, letting your toes drop out, outsides of your thighs, turning out, letting your tailbone tuck underneath, mid-back going flat, letting your shoulders roll down, turning your upper arms out and finally your forearms out, so your thumbs rolling flat toward the mat, pinkies toward your thighs, fingers naturally curled. Chin down, crown back, Letting your head drop down into that pillow. Lengthening out your neck, regaining its natural curve. Completely relax your lips, nothing to say. Completely relax your tongue off the back of your teeth to the back of your mouth. Completely relax your eyes, nothing to look at. We're going to only concentrate on our breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Completely relax your forehead, nothing to think about. Only our breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Now we're, we're ready to begin practicing our square breathing. We'll start with a four count. So as you inhale through the nose, press your belly up toward the ceiling. Lift your navel up. Press it up and don't inhale so fast that it all pushes to maximum right away. Try and control the ascent. Exhale through the mouth. Let your navel drop down, but let gravity pull it down. Don't try and control its descent so much as control the air leaving your nose, leaving your mouth. Let your mid-back sink back down into the mat, into the floor. And those are the four sides of the square. So we'll inhale through the nose, two, three, four, and pause. Exhale down, two, three, four, and completely relax. Pretend you're asleep if you can, completely relax. Pass out. That'll allow you to relax your face down. Inhale through the nose, two, three, four, and pause. Exhale down, two, three, four, and completely relax. Now, as you continue to breathe this way, you're practicing right now with me. Breathing, inhale through the nose. Exhale through the mouth. Try and let your body be breathed like a bellows, stoking that internal fire. As you breathe down, exhale down, pretend you're asleep. Let your body collapse down. Completely pass out, don't hold anything back. Do it like method acting where you're completely passing out, relaxing down, pretending you're asleep as if somebody's watching you and you don't want to move. You relax every muscle down. Most of us were not able to sleep because we think about the next match, the next day, or what we did wrong the day before, the day of, catastrophizing of doing it again. Here we return to our breath. Every time one of those thoughts floats in, we let it float right back out. We return right to our breath, inhaling through the nose, two, three, four, and pause. Exhale down, two, three, four, 
and completely relax. Only your breath completely pass out. Pretend you're asleep. Inhale up, two, three, four, and pause. Exhale down, two, three, four, and completely relax. So that's idling down. In the idle down technique, you're working on moving from your feet to your head, making sure that each regains its alignment, and then you're working on lifting and dropping. Lifting up and dropping down, increasing the length of your square each time. You're starting with four breaths, which is what most people can do when they first start. Most trained athletes can only lift up for four and drop down for four, and you're going to work up to 16, which is great conditioning. There's a lot to put together here. I told you it was a simple technique, and I, I promised that would happen. I can see that you, you, by putting this all together, it looks like there's a lot to it. But the technique itself is, is very simple. How you put it together is the, the, the magic recipe of the simple ingredients. Work on practicing these every day. Implement them into your current existing conditioning regimen. Now, obviously, I can help you with your conditioning as that's my specialization. However, if you don't even want to change the conditioning that you're currently doing by by giving yourself a reset button, you're going to multiply the impact of the conditioning that you're currently doing. And there are many different ways to approach conditioning, but there's only one way to approach your reset. That's through understanding how our nervous system impacts the, the rest of our performance, how it Im impacts our endocrine system, how it impacts our ability to stay fit and functional. When you put this all together, when you learn the, the, the key components, and you start working on your alignment, allow that to carry. See if you can practice that. Even when you're sitting, you should be able to find chin up, chin down, crown up, shoulders pressed into the earth, tailbone slightly tucked. Just find that triangle balance between your two sits bones and your tailbone. So even seat, seated, you should be able to find that realignment, and that will give you the breath that you need. You'll be able to do it on the, on the back, on your back, on top position when you're ground fighting. You should be able to find that alignment. When you start tuning up, when you start uh, tuning in, your vibration will happen not just as an exercise. See, this is the, the point of the reset button. You should only be using that amount of tension necessary to accomplish the task. So your reset button, will you'll start to press it more often. The body will get used to not using superfluous tension and using only the necessary energy and then maximizing how much benefit it gets out of it. So when you depress the reset button, you find that you have so much more energy available and so much more is being accomplished that you do that all the time. And you can continue. The more that you practice this, the more you'll be hitting the reset button in all of your activities, even in your skill performance, in your drilling, in your sparring, in your daily life. So you've tuned up, then you hit the reboot. Your reboot you can do anytime. If you're facing some type of competitive anxiety, if you're about to spar, or if you're going to a new gym or a new school, or if you're having a meeting with your agent or, or your training director, and, or you're about to sit down with uh, a new coaching staff, anything that gives you anxiety, your reboot button will help you, but it will definitely help you throughout all of your competition throughout all of your sparring and drilling and throughout all of your conditioning. So you're trying to practice that reboot wherever you have the need for effort. Once your reboot is set in, then you can throttle up. I don't, and I have to re restate this, I don't advise trying to increase your throttle until you can reboot fully. You need to get the, thr the throttle technique as well as the rest of the techniques here cleared with your physician. Throttle is going to give you an amazing amount of energy. You need to use it judiciously. Don't use it at night. Use it when you need to. Use it to warm up. 
from your throttle, then you're going to work to start to turn it off and start to idle down. The idle down you should be practicing not before you're about to go in. You want to get warmed up. You don't want to go into an event cold. You don't want to go into your conditioning cold. So do it at the end of your session. Do it at the end of the day. But it will also help you clear your head if you have to focus. If there are things that you need to do, you can idle down and that will give you that clarity that you need. But if you need energy, do not idle down. Do not do it at the beginning of the day. You need to power up then. You need to increase your throttle as long as your reboot is set. You use your heart rate monitor as operant conditioning, as biofeedback. So you know what you set your max to, your heart rate max. You set that for your first setting, and then you set your recovery heart rate. Let's say it's 65% of your max, and that's what you need to get to. So it needs to, you need to hear it. Once you hit your heart rate max, you need to hear it beep again to know that you've dropped it down as far as you need to go. You use that biofeedback, the vibration you're breathing together, and it's an incredible, invaluable tool. You can, I, I've gotten six times the recovery rate of my fighters in 10 hours. 10 hours of conditioning, of working this. Not 10 hours total, actually 10 minutes of use. 10 minutes of applying this has given them six times the recovery rate. Out of, 10, out of the 10 hours of training, the 20 sessions that they've done. It can give you six times the energetic preparation of six times the speed. Instead of 20, 20 minutes, you can get your heart rate up in 60 seconds to where it needs to be for your target zone. Use these techniques for two to four months. I guarantee that I've gotten 100% results from my clients. You can contact me by email or on my forum at www.rmaxi.com. Ask me any questions. If you need any help, just go on there, find out my email. If you don't want to talk in a public forum, you can email me and I will get back to you. As my extended client, as my extended athlete, I'll do whatever I can to make sure that I have you have access to me, and I look forward to hearing all of the great results that you're going to achieve by developing your own reset button.